Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us today for, I believe, UVic's first Podcast Curious Day. Um, I'd like to begin by giving the territorial acknowledgement. We acknowledge with respect the Gungwan peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands, and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanic peoples whose historical relationships to the land continue to this day. Cheryl Bryce of the Songhees Nation notes that this place that we are gathered on today was known for camas harvesting, trading, and cultural and spiritual practices. It was a place of nourishment and of learning. It is in this tradition that I feel privileged to be here with all of you today to learn not only about the stories and practices of our panelists, but also the tools that will empower us to share our work with our larger communities. So I would like to end this acknowledgement by personally thanking the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Lusanic communities for this opportunity for us to be here today. I'm Matt Huckalak, the Digital Scholarship Librarian, and Suzanne Ahern and I met about eight months ago and started a conversation about podcasting. And so I would like to introduce Suzanne, who's going to just give a brief introduction about why today is happening. So thank you. Oh, it is? <laughs> I can do it. You want me to do it? No, no, it's cool. You're doing everything else. Um, I don't know about you, but I love podcasting, and I got into podcasting through Hannah McGregor, actually, her Witch Please, was that better? Uh, podcast, a, Harry, a reading of Harry Potter through a feminist lens. And what makes podcasts meaningful to me is I feel like I'm there with someone as I'm doing something. I've actually started doing the dishes, and like, fighting to do the dishes, just so I can listen to podcasts. Um, Podcasting to me is a way for us to communicate as a community, an academic community, with our wider global communities. And as the digital scholarship librarian, this is important for me, and it's my job actually, to empower folks to tell their stories and have the training necessary to do the work that they want to do. And I hope this sounds appropriate, but I was shocked at how popular today was. I mean, this sold out very quickly. And I think it speaks to a thirst in our community of our willingness to communicate and our desire to communicate with our wider audiences. So that is why today formed. And I thank Suzanne and Communications and Marketing for co-sponsoring this event. In fact, they're sponsoring it just a little bit more, to be honest. <laughs> and uh, um, so I really thank you for that opportunity to collaborate and to share this vision to make today happen for us all. So thank you for coming, and I'll pass it off to Suzanne now. Yeah, thanks again uh, for everyone coming. Um, I'm communications officer with the media relations and public affairs team, and um, I'm really excited about finding ways to make podcasting part of the work that we do, telling stories about UVic researchers and students to the wider world. Uh, so I'm just going to do a brief introduction to everyone. Uh, this is Hannah McGregor. She is an assistant professor of publishing at Simon Fraser University and the host of The Secret Feminist Agenda, a podcast about the mundane and radical ways we enact our feminism in our daily lives. She lives in Vancouver on the territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations. Uh, and in the second hour, which I hope you stay for, uh, Hannah is going to talk about her experiment working with Wilfrid Laurier University to come up with a methodology for the evaluation, peer review, design, and dissemination of podcasts as a unique form of scholarly communication. Um, at the far end is uh, Mendel Skulski and uh, Adam Huggins. They're the co-hosts of and co-producers of Future Ecologies podcast, and Adam is also an alum of um, in environmental studies and biology. Um, their podcast explores the world through ecology, design, and sound. Um, Mendel is a designer, tinkerer, mushroom nerd, and stubborn idealist. He describes their life as a series of passion projects 
with a central theme being the ambition to weave our technological zeitgeist with the widely ignored mutualism of the more than human world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a modest ambition. Uh, Adam is a musician and a practitioner of ecological restoration who works at the restor as a restoration coordinator for the Galliano Conservancy on Galliano Island. Um, he has a BSc in biology and environmental studies and a diploma in restoration of natural systems from UVic. Uh, and uh, we are going to be working uh, closely with uh, Mendel and Adam on a podcast that will be launching together in uh, late spring of 2020 based on Bob Gifford's uh, Dragons of Inaction research. Um, Julie Remy is the uh, communications officer with UVic's <laughs> Faculty of Education, and uh, she's also the producer of Learning Transforms podcast. And Jenny Shine is a sound artist and community-based researcher and UVic instructor of the anthropology of sound. She specializes in soundscape composition, creative practices, and feminist teaching models. Jenny is also the Pacific Community Lead at Tides Canada, a national charity where she supports conservation and social justice initiatives in BC. Uh, and Martin Bauman is a second year MFA student in the writing department. His work has been published in the Globe and Mail and on Breakfast TV. He's the host of Story Untold, a podcast about ordinary people living extraordinary lives. So we're going to start, uh, Hannah's going to start us off today. I sure am. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else experience that thing where it's like really hard being near a mic and not talking into it? I like, <laughs> give it to me. It's mine. I earned it. Um, hi, everyone. I was asked to uh, start off with a very brief uh, history of podcasting. Are you ready? I'm a media historian. and I'm, I'm going to keep it really tight. Um, People often ask, like especially when I'm writing grants about my podcasting work, people are like, well, you have to define a podcast. And I'm like, well, it's an MP3 file on the internet, um, which is kind of me being a jerk, but is also kind of what a podcast is. So it's this beautiful rudimentary technology. It is by definition an MP3 file on the internet. More specifically, it is an MP3 file that is shared via an RSS feed. That's a really simple syndication. It's like... Does anybody remember before Facebook when you subscribed to blogs via a feed service? You would like go into your Google feed and you would choose the blogs you liked and you would subscribe to them and you could open your feed and see all of the new vegan recipes. I assume that's what we were all subscribing to in the early 2000s. It was all just squash recipes. Um, but that's the technology that podcasts are still using, um, which is it's kind of remarkable. I'll talk about this a bit in the second hour, but it's kind of a remarkable thing that in the age of uh, corporate consolidation and uh, corporately owned algorithms, we have a little corner of the internet that still operates according to the logics of the open web. So podcasting dates back to 2004, and its name is a beautiful and completely historically anachronistic uh, portmanteau of, anybody want to hazard a guess, podcasting? Pod comes from iPod and casting comes from broadcasting, which is great because it's not broadcasting and never has been, and also none of us have iPods anymore. So that's a funny <laughs> name for it. Um, and when it started off, it was still a pretty niche form. Uh, it was predominantly sort of like small underground fandom communities that were making them and then sort of the tech community. And it took a while for them to catch on because before we had portable devices that had internet on them, you had to download a podcast onto a computer and then plug your iPod into it and then upload the podcast from your computer onto your iPod. And like, who's got the time? None of us have the time for that. Uh, and so smartphones were, were a real groundbreaking technology in terms of mainstreaming podcasting. The fact that we have devices that we carry everywhere with us, that we can download files directly onto, that we also use to listen to music, it, it's a perfect platform for podcasting. Um, so that's part of the sort of explosion of podcasting we've seen recently. Part of it is also that recording technology gets cheaper and cheaper every year, so it consistently lowers the barrier to access. And then the other, you know, people really love pointing to 2013 as the year that podcasting truly went mainstream. We all know what happened in 2013, right? 
Yeah, I love this. I'm such a teacher. I'm like, come on, participate. <laughs> yeah, 2013 was the year that Serial came out. And Serial was the first podcast that the producers of This American Life made as a sort of born digital podcast, right? Not as radio that was getting remediated into a podcast. And the really interesting thing with Serial was that Ira Glass like went on to, like, I think it was the the Daily Show to show people how to download a podcast. Like as recently as 2013, Ira Glass still had to go on to late night television and be like, okay, here's this app on your phone. It says podcast, that's a giveaway of what it's gonna let you do. And so that recently, it was sort of, people were still, it was still making the move as a medium from in extremely niche into increasingly mainstream. As of 2019, I think we can confidently say that podcasting is part of our mainstream um, shared media ecosystem. Podcasts saturate our, uh, you know, how television shows are made, um, how uh, celebrity culture is built. It, it's, it's infiltrated our media consumption at all kinds of levels. Um, and that has also come through in the number of podcasts that are made. So I think last count on Apple Podcasts, there's something like 750,000 podcasts. So there's a lot of them. And people often say to me, oh, and you hear these jokes all the time, like, oh, everybody's dog has a podcast now, um, which I th always think is really funny because um, that joke, everybody's dog has a podcast, uh, just happened to align with the meaningful breaking of, of women and people of color into the podcasting space. So it's like as soon as a medium gets diversified, a bunch of people were like, mm, it's pretty much over now. It's not, I assure you. Um, there's lots of voices and stories that don't exist yet in the world of podcasting and that are needed and that there will be people who are excited about them. What's happening is that it's becoming a really deeply democratized medium because um, it is in so many ways so easy to make one. Um, so there's a lot of really exciting opportunities <laughs> still in the world of podcasting um, and more and more resources for people who are, who are interested in getting involved. That's my, how is that? that was Good? Amazing. Cool. Yeah. Podcasting. Um, and now I think we're going to listen to, stop. <laughs> We're going to listen to a clip from Secret Feminist Agenda. So Secret Feminist Agenda is um, the second podcast that I started making. I will talk a little bit more about my podcasting history in the second hour. But um, the first podcast I started making, I started in uh, spring of 2015. It was called Witch Please. Uh, it's a feminist podcast about the Harry Potter world. Uh, I started my next podcast, Secret Feminist Agenda, in... 2017, uh, and when I had made the move to Simon Fraser University, where I am now. And it was my first sort of serious foray into um, trying to incorporate podcasting into my practice as a researcher. So which please certainly can be interpreted as a scholarly podcast, but that was never its intention. But Secret Feminist Agenda was meant from the, oh, this is going to be a lie. And nothing I ever do is meant from the beginning to be anything. Um, but Secret Feminist Agenda from early on was something I was thinking about as scholarly. Uh, it's mostly an interview podcast. So uh, the format that I now use that I settled on in the second season is alternating interview episodes and what I call mini-sodes. And the mini-sodes are just me talking for 15, 20 minutes about a topic of my choosing, something on my mind, something I'm grappling with. I have an episode about Jurassic Park, but I also have an episode about white supremacy. So just, you know, wherever I'm at. Um, and then the interview episodes are interviews with interesting feminists about the way they are enacting their feminism. Often not explicitly about the way they are enacting their feminism, I just find interesting feminists and then talk to them for an hour. And that is really easy to do because, as the tagline of the podcast goes, feminists are inherently interesting. <laughs> so. What you are about to hear is a one minute clip from a season four episode uh, called Off Mic Conversations with Karani Baroka. Um, Oka, which is how she goes, is um, a indigenous Indonesian performance artist and poet and disability studies critic who happened to be in Vancouver for a conference and sent me an email and was like, hi, I like your podcast, can I be on it? And I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> great. Um, so she came and hung out with me in my office and we talked about um, her work, particularly she's involved in 
a performance piece where she is reimagining the Gauguin painting um, Anna the Javanese. And what she is doing is um, cripping Anna. So reading Anna as uh, a disabled figure and thinking about disability and its intersection with uh, colonialism and gendered violence. So you're going to hear a little clip of us talking about that. Anything is possible. If you say that a girl can be from all of these different places at once, <laughs> you know, like what I'm trying to prove yeah. is that, you know, our archives are fiction. Yeah. These are historical oh, artifacts yeah. that you think are nonfiction and set in stone. They all contradict each other. They're fictions. Yeah. I'm not doing anything new. Right? That's such a powerful way to frame it. To say, like, we know this is fictional, yeah. so I'm going to tell different stories. Yeah. But also, like the, like, the thing that struck me immediately when you said, you know, all of these scholars are responding to you and saying, well, how could you possibly know that she is in chronic pain? How could you possibly know that she's disabled? It's like, well, how the fuck could you possibly know that she's I'm able? So very nice. Like, why does yes. that get to be right. the assumption? Why is, why is that framing a logical and reasonable and sound one? Yeah. But the possibility of disability is like right. a wild premise that demands <laughs> proof. Even though she was, you know, she would have been in Paris in the 1890s, like one of the most vulnerable groups to be, you know, to have acquired disability, yeah. to be disabled. Okay, it was really hard. I cut it. I cut it off there because she goes on to talk about, in really interesting ways, about the the intersection of colonialism and disability, and that that is sort of what her work is about. And um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about why a podcast. Oh, great. Well, you know what? You can hear more about why a podcast in the second hour. Let's hear from these other people. Thank you for that incredible introduction. That was awesome. Um, and I, it was nice to relive, actually share, what do you think, I don't know. Sure. It was nice to relive the past decade in, in this beautiful like little historical uh, nugget. Um, and thank you, Suzanne and Matt, for, for having us here. Um, Future Ecologies is a podcast we started a couple years ago. It actually began in a UVic class, a Natalie Band's sailboat class, um, and the flexibility to create a final project that was unique and novel uh, allowed me to say, let's try this thing. Um, and Mendel was so kind to oblige me in joining me uh, and seeing what happened. Um, the clip that we're going to play from Future Ecologies, just to jump right into it, um, we were speaking to a man named Paul Hesberg. He is a senior forester uh, with the USDA in Wenatchee, Washington. We've been doing a whole series. We've been obsessed with wildfire um, and, and what's been happening. And we've been doing this, th these, these series on wildfire. And Paul was able to articulate in seven distinct principles what is happening in our forested ecosystems. Um, and so I think without any further ado. Um, maps lie. Maps that come out as sophisticated GISs lie. They persuade us that what we just mapped can be permanent, and there is no permanence. The ideas that come out of the seven principles are that what you want to do is generate the patterns and the characteristics of landscapes that are constantly being nudged and thrown around. And they're thrown around differently when you're working with the operating rules of that particular system. Adopting the seven principles is not essentially raising the level of your craft so now you're perfect at engineering the landscape. It's actually saying, we think the landscape wants to work in this way. Get somewhere within the wobble of that system and then allow wildfires and climate to continually nudge it. Um, so I would just say that uh, the reason that we chose this clip is because it, it's kind of representative of what, uh, what we want to do as a show. And I think um, what we're talking about here is that um, what, what Paul's research has done is, is a, a meta study on wildfire ecology. And he's condensed that down as far as he can to reach people with these seven takeaways. Because as he acknowledges in the, in the whole episode, that's really he's looking for solutions that people can, as he says, keep in RAM, what you can actually walk around with and, and just hold on to these seven things. And then even further articulates this one tiny phrase, uh, get in the wobble, which can cover like so much ground here. And so looking for these kind of you know, not, not data-driven necessarily, not fact-based, but really um, emotional responses to how we can relate to the ecosystem is, is our overarching goal. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I think one of one of the interesting side effects of the podcasting revolution is that now when you talk to people, you're like telling little stories at what what they call dinner parties or stuff like that. You have all these little facts, right? Mm -hmm. And some of them are shared facts. You're like, oh yeah, I heard that podcast too. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, uh, in a certain sense, like we really didn't want to contribute to that. And I'm not sure how, how useful all those little factoids end up being for us in, in the way that we approach our lives. And especially living in and on this planet, you know, we're concerned with ecology. We're concerned with, 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 with how we live and what we do and why we do it. Um, and what we're really trying to do when we're talking about getting in the wobble, when Paul is talking about getting in the wobble, is that no matter how much information, no matter how many facts you pluck out of the data that you, that you derive, uh, no matter what information you're operating on from a, from a, from a factual level, you, can't, you can never have enough to really understand what's happening from all the different perspectives, especially in ecology. These systems are incredibly complex, but socially as, as well. Um, and so for, for us, we're trying to say, OK, like, how can we take this and get somewhere within the orbit of what what we're talking about without pinning it down, without trying to to freeze it in amber, or or um, or or give this direct answer to the question: How can we how can we get in 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 the orbit of what we want to talk about? That's kind of been our approach to to making this. Um, I'm really interested, actually, to hear what you have to say later about peer review and. We've been trying to figure out how to cite our sources really well within the podcast because I love source citation, but we don't want to make it overly academic, mm -hmm. right? We don't want to lock people out. At the same time, like all the information that we include does come from somewhere. We're not anti-facts. Uh, <laughs> uh, insofar, we just you know it's um, it's 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 very much a question of how do you balance that? Mm -hmm. This stuff is derived from from real data and real people, um, and that's traditional knowledge, that's scientific knowledge. That's other, other forms of knowledge that are <laughs> completely different from those two. Um, like, you know, just experience. But also say that you know, the facts aren't the thing that we want you to take from this necessarily. Um, one, can I say one more thing before? Um, I do ecological restoration. And by the time an ecosystem has gotten to the state where it requires ecological restoration, so many things have gone wrong. <laughs> like a massive number of things have gone wrong. And it's really a last ditch solution. It's not a good way to approach the world. Um, and so really, you know, we want to prevent things from getting to that place. Um, and I don't know if that's developing scientific and ecological literacy in people, or if it's really just like restoring, and, and the word that we've used in the past is restoring the mind, right? Mm -hmm. Changing the way that we think and the way that we act so that it ripples outward and we don't have to get in a situation where we're like, having to try to put ecosystems together piece by piece with the data that we think we can collect. Um, that's what I have to say about podcasting. Do you have anything to add to that? Um, I would say about, uh, ooh. it's funny, I'm not used to uh, just having one shot to say something. Usually I do three or four takes on the show, so this is, <laughs> this is a novel experience. Um, yeah, no, I think, I think you covered it well. Um, I'll, let's pass it along. Maybe I'll, I'll come up with something later. Yeah. 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 Hi. Uh, so I'm Julie, and I feel uh, Julie Remy from the Faculty of Education. I'm uh, the communications officer, and I feel very humble to be at this table. Uh, I think I'm probably the one that has the least experience in podcasting, but it shows also that we can all do it. So, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah. Are you going to play the audio? Uh, so I, I just chose kind of the introduction uh, to our uh, episodes as just to give a feel of, of, of the episode, but it's, uh, it has already evolved into something else. Uh, and um, yeah, anyway, I'll talk more about it after. Ready? Absolutely. Here we go. You're listening to Learning Transforms from the Faculty of Education at the University of Victoria. I'm Ted Rickin. And I'm Courtney Baldwin. And we're coming to you from the unceded territories of the Lekwungen speaking people and the Assange people. Welcome to the show. Okay, I'm going to start. Today we have Mike Irvin with us, and we're really, really fortunate to have Mike because 
Uh, a, he's a UVic Faculty of Education alumni, and B, he's done some amazing work using educational technology in some really, really innovative ways. And I, I think Mike's uh, probably best known for his master's thesis defense that he did several years ago, and to my knowledge, it's the first, uh, maybe not the only at this point, but certainly the first thesis defense ever to be conducted from the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> So anyway, <laughs> yeah. So basically, uh, our podcast. The, why did we choose to do a podcast in the first place? Was that um, we wanted to to reach out to more people than everybody who we were already reaching out to, but because the number of podcast listeners is growing world, worldwide, and it's even more so in Canada, it seems so why not tap into this opportunity? So, um, so we decided to do um, a show also because we wanted to give an opportunity to students to learn something uh, and either by becoming a host themselves or uh, recording or editing. So, and so that was also one of the, the key thing for us was to make sure that students would be able to participate. Um, and then we also wanted to kind of explode the idea that education is all about teacher edu education. It is about that, but it's also about so much more. Uh, there's lots of research uh, done on uh, mental health, um, physical health, uh, kinesiology, indigenous language revitalization, and leadership, and it just keeps going. So we wanted to show how vast the field is. Um, and there, yeah, we thought that that would be a really good way to have a conversation with people and show, um, just kind of have them talk about what they do and, and uh, invite people who have interesting um, contributions that they could, they, yeah. So people who are actually, yeah, students, researchers, uh, faculty members, staff, um, alumni, anybody who had a connection with education at large who just kind of took something from what they learned in education and transformed it into something amazing that contributed to the world. So something a little bit outside the box, but uh, that was still part of education to inspire people to do something beyond what they learned. So how did we start? Basically, uh, in 2017-ish, towards the end of it, um, I was having a, a discussion with Ted Regan, who used to be the, the dean of the Faculty of Education, and uh, had a podcast of his own, and was like, why, why don't we do something and that might actually work out? Why not? And, and so we, we looked into that, and uh, with our co-op student who was who just liked to listen to podcasts but had no experience whatsoever, uh, we decided to start something. And so it, it really started small, so we uh, had a lot of help from, uh, from Susan who helped us understand better how that all worked. Uh, I myself had no experience whatsoever with podcasting. And I just kind of learned as I went uh, to produce what it meant to produce a, a podcast. And so um, we, we just started with the gear that we had. It, at first, it sounded like we were recording from the bottom of a toilet. And slowly, <laughs> it got better and better as, as we improved on our mics. And, uh, and we were recording in, well, in the UCNM studio at the beginning, and now we we moved up in the world, and we're in the music studio, which is uh, a really sweet space to record in. Um, and we have better equipment, and so it 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 really evolves as we as we move uh, forward. Um, and the team changed uh, quite a bit since, because at the beginning. We were two plus me, and now uh, we incorporated a, a, another student to have two perspectives, to have two different hosts with different angles, 
and then now now we're six, uh, and we have three hosts that we can tap. Uh, like we kind of alternate; they're all coming from different um, different uh, departments in education, so they have different angles, different perspectives, and for certain topics because it's so vast, it helps. Uh, it helps us kind of uh, uh, keep the subject well, keep it interesting. Um, and so what have we learned from, from our experience so far, just kind of starting this without knowing what we were doing and what were our challenges? And so basically, um, yeah, have backups for everything because it's, it's a nightmare. There's always something that goes wrong. I, the gear is so fragile. Uh, if you're borrowing gear, something may not be there anymore. It may have been lost and you need to find uh, another one. Uh, the studio might be taken while it's supposed to be your time or anyway, something, there's something going to happen no matter what. Um, and editing takes a lot of time, especially if you don't know what you're doing and you're working with students. Um, it It's something really to consider like if you want to start your podcast it's not just like I'm gonna record and yeah it's done you know it's it's uh, for us anyway like one hour of recording can take 10 hours of editing so that's uh, something to keep in mind um, and yeah always keep recording after the show is over because that's often the best parts and the same is uh, about if yeah, the least prepared your people are, uh, the more natural they will sound. Because if you ask them the question as they come in the room before you start recording, it won't sound as good the next time that you ask it while the mic is, is on. Um, yeah, and it always takes so much longer than we expect. <laughs> um, otherwise, yeah, rec some just a few recommendations from... Just some questions that we asked ourselves. Yeah, do you want to go professionally uh, with your podcast? Like, if you hire someone, they would do it way faster. It might actually cost you less than working with a student. Um, but do you want to give an opportunity to students as well? Um, we're in a university, so it kind of makes sense. Um, and yeah, it. You, if you want to just do it on your own, that's that's great. But otherwise, you need a budget and make sure that you have the proper gear so it doesn't sound like you're at the bottom of the ocean or a toilet or something. <laughs> and uh, learn from the experience and play with it. Um, this is so exciting just to be in a library talking about audio storytelling. Thank you so much for this opportunity and and sound. I I would, I'm more like, on the spectrum of sound curious, <laughs> as opposed to podcasts. Um, I'm really yeah. That's my my bag. Is I I really I come from the field of acoustic ecology or acoustic ethnography, soundscape studies. So I'm really into how we listen. Um, and I really like the idea of keeping podcasts weird. So it's a cool medium. We don't have to have the same sort of narrative tropes or um, all a certain demographic producing them. And we can also have different ways of editing them. So, um, oh, that's me. I, I teach uh, anthropology of sound. And a couple summers ago, I taught acoustic ethnography at the Bamfield Marine Science Center. And uh, the clip that I'll be, that's going to be playing are two um, portions of student compositions. So one is by Lydia Turnberg, who's actually a grad student in anthropology at UVic right now. And her piece is called Being. And the other piece is by Elizabeth Ellis, who's an artist in Vancouver. And her piece is called Bamfield Fanning, Goodbye, Old Man. And I'm just going to, this is going to be weird. It's going to be weird. <laughs> so, so here we are.
Yeah, so those are two portions, excerpts of, a, of student sound compositions. And um, yeah, sound is amazing. You can use it in so many different ways and podcasting is one way to do it. And again, it's something a sound um, story or composition that lives online. And um, what we were able to do is we did field recordings so we captured our own sounds. We also had access to Ocean Network Canada's sound bank of underwater sounds, and they have a hydrophone in Banfield in Hawaiian um, territory. So students accessed those sounds, and we had access to uh, the Banfield Historical Society audio recordings. So um, you heard in the first piece, Lydia's piece, fin whales and humpback songs with dolphin calls. She played you know, musical instruments and she also was exploring her body sounds, so her breathing, that was called being. And um, Elizabeth's song, or piece was, um, it's about the Commonwealth Trans-Pacific Telegraph cable system and their last signal uh, to Bamfield was goodbye um, Bamfield Fanning, goodbye old man. And she used that, as, so she explored Morse code, which was what the telegraph was about, and how the operators would be listening to them, the noise, um, the sort of the, the stir disturbances of, of the soundscape, um, and how we listen to those sounds. Um, so, yeah, there's so many different ways to use sounds. We have, like, different types of people can get into it. We had scientists and geographers and anthropologists and artists and even faculty from Emily Carr. It was, it was amazing. You can mobilize these pieces in so many different ways. They can go online, they can go on radio, local radio, um, national radio. You can use them in sound exhibi exhibitions like um, we had um, a community day at Banfield where people came to listen. We also had an exhibit at the Royal BC Museum. So there's so many different ways to mobilize. You can lift things from pages. You can lift um, data, text, stories, theory, and bring it out into the public. And that is why I think sound is awesome. <laughs> So my name is Martin Bauman. Uh, I've been doing a podcast called Story Untold for about two and a half years now, coming up on three in April. And uh, Story Untold, I call it uh, Ordinary People with Extraordinary Lives. That's, that's basically my way of giving me license to talk to anybody I find interesting, uh, which is probably the worst way to develop a following. The, the kind of the general principle is to build your niche, find your niche, and then people will find you if they're interested in the same things. Uh, but I'm interested in hip hop, and I'm interested in basketball, and in writing, and in mental health, and in ecology, and all sorts of things. And so this has been my chance to, uh, to, to do that, and I think you know, people have found it regardless. Um, the clip I want to play for you today comes from uh, Sheila Rogers. She was, uh, I, so these are interviews that I do, and, and Sheila Rogers, uh, the host of CBC's Next Chapter, uh, mental health advocate and also a uh, chancellor here at UVic. Um, and I think she's a good encapsulation of the sorts of people that I find interesting and, and worthy of talking to. Uh, I'll try and preface the question I believe I was asking her because I think I just start with her talking. I was interested in, she, she has a bio, she's, uh, she's listed on the Canadian Canoe Museum and her bio uh, says something to the effect of we're all in the same boat and she's going off of that. We need to support each other in our suffering. We need to be, I love the root of the word compassion because what it really literally means is to suffer with. And I think we are all in the same boat. The statistics in Canada say that one out of five Canadians suffers from a mental illness or will in their life. And I really <laughs> believe it's, it's probably closer to one in four. We know about the one in five because they are the people that will come forward. There are people who don't feel that they can come forward yet. So being in the same boat means that we've got to get in the boat and help the person that is dealing with that person. And I love the canoe metaphor very much because we get in a canoe and we all pull, we all go forward together. 
Maps lie. So Maps that come out as sophisticated GIS is lie. <laughs> Sorry, I really just wait for a second here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'll talk just very briefly about how I got into the world of podcasting. Then I, I'll try and make my case for why I think it's worthy of, of anyone pursuing it uh, as a creative endeavor or, or something else. Uh, I come from the world of, of commercial news radio. That was kind of my gig before getting into podcasting. I worked as both a radio news anchor and news reporter. And, uh, and podcasting was something I picked up after I left that world. I, in some senses, I kind of became a little bit uh, disillusioned with uh, not all aspects, but in some ways I felt like uh, commercial radio and, and broadcasting often tends to, you might be talking to somebody for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, and you've got to then condense that into a, a 15 second sound bite. It's got to be quick and succinct, and uh, there's not a lot of room for depth or nuance in conversations. It's all about uh, brevity which is fine in its own medium, but, but podcasting is sort of the antithesis of that, and I really love that for it. Uh, it's also, I, I find podcasting is opposite to what I've been doing in that uh, a conversation like, uh, so I'll give you an example. Yesterday, uh, I had been interviewing somebody for the podcast. It'll be on an upcoming episode. His name uh, is Mark Hamer, and he's an author from Cardiff, Wales. A fascinating guy, had been uh, homeless for a period in his life in his early teens, uh, ended up becoming a, a magazine editor. He worked in art galleries. He ended up teaching uh, creative writing in a prison and became a gardener and a mole catcher. And he wrote a book about how to catch a mole. And so I, I was talking to him for a long time. And, and this is a great example of somebody who, <coughs> there would be no space for him if I was still working in traditional broadcasting to say, hey, I think we need to put a story together on this guy. It's just, it just wouldn't fit into the sort of the course of a news wheel because... Uh, it's, first of all, it's not local, and it's not to do with anything particularly timely, let's say. Uh, but I think there's still value in, in talking to people like that and hearing their stories. And so podcasting, I think, is a wonderful way that allows for somebody like Mark's story, somebody like Sheila's story, to be explored in depth, to hear them in their own voice, and uh, over the course of a longer, more meaningful conversation. Uh, what I think podcasting is great for, why I love it, why I think anybody else would love doing it, I think all of us would probably feel the same way, it's, I feel like it's some sort of this weird loophole that we've created in our world, at least in the, in the form of interview-based podcasting that I do, where we've given people license, it's a license to be curious and ask questions. It's a license to call somebody up who otherwise you would have no connection to and say, hey, I think you're interesting and I want to talk to you. Like, uh, I don't know in, in what other world I would call up somebody like Mark Hamer, who lives in another continent, in another city, and, and find him and say, hey, you know, I've, I've got your email address or your phone number. First of all, he's probably wondering, who are you? And, uh, and why do you want to talk to me? And, and so podcasting is this kind of strange clause that we've allowed people to, a socially acceptable way of doing that. And so I think it's great because of that. It, it gives you freedom to go out and talk to these people, and it's wonderful. I think that I think there's uh, there's value in doing that uh, in doing that as a podcaster. Uh, for me, it's been great in my own line of work. I'm here as an MFA student. I'm in the writing department, and uh, and in my work, I'm I'm writing a, a work of creative nonfiction about depression, specifically depression in men. And for me, podcasting has been a space where I'm able to talk to people to further my knowledge and and further kind of that that base of learning about the, the, about the subject. And so whether it's talking to somebody like Sheila Rogers about her experience with depression, I've talked to countless people in different realms, uh, whether they're uh, neuroscientists talking about the brain, whether it's somebody, uh, I talked to a couple, John Rathwell and Tracy Gennard, they're from the Ottawa Gatineau region, and they decided one day that they both lost, both lost loved ones to suicide and they decided to quit their jobs. They bought a camper van, they traveled across North America uh, interviewing people about how they pursued happiness. They called it searching for sero, uh, sero being serotonin. Uh, those sorts of things is what podcasting has enabled me to do and I think is, is a great license for anyone to do because it's not like uh, I have any special credentials as a podcaster, it's just a curiosity and podcasting is, uh, is an enabler of curiosity in a, in a wonderful way, I think, to uh, connect people uh, from, from all over the world. 
Well, thank you all. And I do want to add what marvelous voices you all have, which I think adds to this as well. Um, we have some time for questions, but before I take questions from the audience, I do want to point out a couple people in the audience, including Bill Blair, who's sitting right there. We are starting a podcasting uh, lab here at the library and have equipment, so if you want to participate in this endeavor, you'll be able to do that in the library. Um, so just know that as we move forward with questions. If you have a question, raise your hand and I'll come to you with the microphone. First of all, I want to thank Matt. I'm a librarian here, uh, biology and anthropology too. So I'm 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 interested in here, but also because Matt, I said why podcast? You know, like who has time to listen to it? But this has been totally <laughs> fascinating. So thank you, Matt, for making sure we librarians knew about it. So I have many questions, but I have to leave now at one o'clock. So I'm sorry. I'm glad it's being recorded, so I can listen to your talk. But. Um, one question, and you don't have to answer it now, but as a librarian, we collect scholarly and, you know, the, the cultural heritage. So podcast becomes another object that we are going to have to figure out how to try to collect. And maybe it's probably not time to address that now, or maybe Matt's already figured it out. But when, if, if the question I really want you to address is when somebody's being interviewed on one of your podcasts and you go then through this huge editing process, before you actually then publish that podcast, does the interviewee get a chance to listen to the podcast and say, A-OK? -okay? Or do they kind of sign away their rights before they, when they agree to be podcasting? So I'm just interested in, in specifically that question, if, if that's even an interesting question. It was to me, but... Can I just note really briefly, I'm going to let somebody else answer the interview question, but I just want to note that um, I'm just put in a Shirk grant to work with librarians to develop practices for archiving podcasts using Dublin Core uh, compliant metadata. So we're working on it. Other questions? Uh, but that one, the interview one. I'll, I'll, I can speak to yeah, that yeah, quickly. Yeah, maybe, that. maybe somebody else has thoughts. I think I've done it both ways. Uh, I've done it, and in, in generally speaking, the editing that I'm doing I don't tend to do a lot of comprehensive editing in terms of actual dialogue. If anything, usually it's it's trying to make both myself and them sound smarter. <laughs> it's it's getting rid of the ums and uhs and unnatural pauses in conversation that might, or you know, if someone needs to clear their throat, that's the kind of stuff I'm generally getting rid of. And so I don't think they tend to be too offended about that. <laughs> but I have at times uh, gone, if I, if I do try to edit a more substantial piece out, if somebody's rambling uh, or I feel like uh, I need to, because of technology being what it is, sometimes I'm talking to somebody over Skype and the connection kind of glitches, that's maybe a case where it's worth at times checking in with somebody saying, hey, you know, here's what happened during the recording, here's what I've done. Uh, I don't know that there's a hard and fast to it. It's something worth considering for sure, but that's, that's at least how I've approached it. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're kind of on the opposite end of the scale where uh, a lot of what we do is, is gather a bunch of interviews and then go over them with a fine-tooth comb and identify these little sections that we want to use and then put them together in a non-linear way. And, and we've done the same thing where sometimes I'll uh, offer a script review to somebody because I want to get their take on how I'm representing them and, and just factually what we're putting out there on their behalf. Um, and it's a, it, it can be a, a real question of power dynamics and who that person is and what their role is. Um, if you're interviewing a politician, how much chance do you want to give them to massage their message versus how much are you there to say, like, this is what we talked about? Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's a, it can be sensitive, right? There's all sorts of questions of journalistic ethics there. Um, most conventional practice is to not uh, give people the chance to review once you've had them sign a release, then it's yours and you have a, an ethical responsibility to um, shepherd that into the, the public listenership. But um, I think it's flexible, right? Yeah, and we, yeah. We, we actually have two different releases. One, we kind of, depending on who we're talking to and, and, and um, you know, we've, li we've interviewed a bunch of incredible knowledge holders and elders and we want to make sure that we're not re misrepresenting them and that they um, don't put any information out there that they don't want actually to have revealed publicly, and so we give them a, a complete right of refusal. And we've we've had one person um, say, you know what, I I didn't like the way that my interview came out. Um, I, it doesn't feel like it represents me, and so I don't want to have it aired. And we we totally pulled that. We respect that. For other people, 
you know, for the most part, and it, it hasn't been a big issue for the most most part. And, and sometimes you're, the people you interview are your best fact checkers, so um, yeah, most, it's helpful to give them the chance. And, and mostly the rationale between, behind not doing it in the, in the conventional field would be uh, to not have too many people getting involved in cooking up what you're trying to produce more than it is like trying to expose somebody for saying something, right? It's not doing them any justice to do that. But. Yeah, and for us, we, um, before we start the interview with, with the, the guests, we, we tell them that everything is recorded, obviously, but that we will edit and that not everything will be shared. And to kind of, it's okay if they don't want something to be, to be, well, if they say something and they're like, yeah, I, I think this should be out, like, we'll totally respect that. And even we had a few that called us like the next day and saying, hey, that, that thing that I said there, do you mind if we get rid of it? And it's totally fine. Um, but we don't let them just kind of decide on how we edit. Um, and we just, yeah, it's, it's, it would just take way too long. It would be impossible to get there. Yeah. I've done uh, with, with, Anthropological research. I think that's like a different, a different story, um, versus, I don't know, um, sort of more entertainment maybe. Um, so I have my research informants or the folks that I'm researching um, have a listen and make sure that they feel they're represented. Um, and then when I'm working for clients, like producing podcasts for other people, just so I don't go insane, I make a script. I get them approved, and then I don't have to spend way too many hours later in the sound editing room. And then there's another question around if you're creating soundscape composition. Um, and something that's really cool is you can actually co-compose with um, community members or youth or, um, yeah. So I've done that before as well. So sharing that, and then people have that agency to actually be in the studio. Thank you. Uh, hi there. Um, thanks to everyone for being here today. It's been really insightful so far. Um, my question has to do with approach, uh, specifically when beginning a new project, and if you can think back even more specifically to beginning your first project. Um, do you... Uh, do you, have you looked to create a series before releasing anything? So a series of episodes as an example, um, hearing that it might be 10 hours of editing for every hour of uh, production or, or interviewing or what have you. Uh, I imagine that even after the first one, you're both excited and anxious and nervous and all of it. Do you bother going through the actual creation, editing, having a series of episodes finished before releasing anything, or if anyone can address any of that, that would be great. So I recently started uh, my fourth podcast, because I like to do too many podcasts, and it is being produced by a friend of mine, and that friend, and I'm co-hosting it with him, and that friend, it's his first time producing a podcast. He's an experienced sound producer, but he was very nervous about the publicness of podcasting. And so we chatted about sort of, you know, where his mental blocks were. Um, and I suggested exactly that, that we record all of the episodes and that he produce all of the episodes and that we release them all together. And that for him meant that there was less of a timeline, which is more sort of a mental, like he's not an academic, he's a freelancer, so he's got other kinds of constraints on his time. And it also meant that he could take as much time as he wanted to make it sound exactly the way he wanted to, which was something like a weekly podcast is extremely difficult. You're batting up against the constraints of time all the time. So I think depending on the project, that's a really viable approach to say like, I know I'm gonna do, 13 episodes in this place, it's because we're talking about the good place and season one has 13 episodes. So like we're gonna do 13 episodes, we're gonna record them all and then it can take you a year to edit them if you want. Like this isn't time sensitive, so he's just able to take as much time as he wants to produce them just how he wants and that's fine. It's not totally the norm in podcasting, it's usually a serially released medium, but it's not unheard of. So we, we had a really interesting test bed, which was doing this as a, as a school project for Adam's class. And we took, I think, probably three or four months to make that one first episode just to get a feel for it. 
Uh, and then after that, we decided that we actually liked what we'd made well enough that we wanted to keep going with the series, and then more or less produced 50% of our first season. And then we got caught behind the eight ball at one point. We decided we were going for a bi-weekly release, and at some point, we just got jammed up on what we'd, uh, we'd gotten everything we'd done out the door, and we were getting caught up on what we had yet to produce, so we had to take a little break and, and catch our breath, and now we're on a monthly release, which is much more sustainable for us. So those are things to keep in mind, but I think, yeah, if you can, if you can wet your feet a little bit, and then if it's working out, um, try one or the other. Yeah. Also sustainable for the listener, just a, a pitch out there, I now listen to something like 60 or 70 different podcasts, and this is how you fall down the wormhole once you get started, right? Um, it takes over your life. And uh, yeah, a pitch for producing less and making it really good um, and making it weird, yeah. keeping it weird. Um, that's what we're trying to do, not to just like pile on to the content that's out there. I know a lot of, if you read podcasting how-tos, people will say like, you gotta keep the content coming out. Like every week, you know, you gotta keep people engaged. And that might be true if you're trying to sell stuff. We're not trying to sell anything. Um, and we want our listeners to be happy and not feel stressed about keeping up or anything like that, so. And, and maybe another factor to keep in mind too is that you know, you'll know you want to take some holiday, uh, your staff or the, the team is going to be sick once in a while or a, a, a guest may not show up. So you, you definitely want to be, uh, to have some time uh, and not be stressing out every single episode. Um, so if you have at least a few episodes uh, recorded ahead of time, you, you can relax a little bit more and think more about the next one that you'll produce. I, I will say just one thing, uh, and I, I would agree with everything as well. Uh, when I started, I, I think I had a bank of maybe two to three episodes. But I think what was true for me anyways, and it might be more broadly true, is I, th I think it's easier to maintain a momentum of something if it's already in motion, as opposed to you know starting from a standstill position. And so there was something to just putting that first one out there that that alone kind of broke whatever inhibitions I had about continuing. I just had to do it, and then I would continue to do it. Uh, whereas, I mean, I've been thinking about the, the podcast I do now for weeks and months uh, of, of just kind of planning and try to pre-plan everything, and I, and I realized you know, that could go on uh, indefinitely if I don't at some point just decide to put the first one out. I'm so sorry, but we have to get ready for the next session of this group. But thank you so much for coming, and thank you for your questions. Uh, would the podcasters mind if we shared your email contacts on our webpage that we've put together, uvic.ca podcasting, if people have follow-up questions for everyone? Please do, and, and we're always happy working with first-time producers. So. Excellent. Thank you. And I do have some gifts for everyone. And while I hand those out, uh, please join me in thanking everyone for sharing. Sure.